Welcome back to the Crypto Trends Podcast, where we cover all things cryptocurrency, blockchain, Web 3.0, and AI. I'm Robert Croak, and I'm joined by my co-host, Armando Pantoja. Both of us and our amazing team are excited to bring you the best information, guidance, and strategies each and every Wednesday. So follow along, and as always, take notes and take action. So let's get into talking point number one. 75% of Bitcoin has not moved in six plus months. I think this is very strong and shows a lot of bullish momentum for Bitcoin. Even though trading is closing around the $60,000 mark, I see it as a very bullish sentiment for Bitcoin moving forward. Yeah, uh, so that shows uh, that there's a reduced supply out there. That means there's not enough Bitcoin to go around. Uh, for long-term investing, this is a positive sign because if there's not enough Bitcoin going around, when retail involvement does come back in the next couple of months, it's going to be a fight over the Bitcoin that exists in the marketplace. So I think it's a positive sign that we have 75% of people holding. I hope that people see it for what it is. Right. And I hope it's not just institutions holding. I hope it's a lot of retail people, a lot of people who want to build wealth that are holding Bitcoin in that 75% uh, mark. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is that with increased confidence, people are looking at Bitcoin finally as more of a long-term investment instead of trying to get in and out and worrying about the volatility that happens within the crypto space. And I read something yesterday that one of the larger exchanges said that over 75% of their listeners and followers stated that they felt we would see $100,000 Bitcoin in this bull market as we speak. I believe it's going to be higher than that, but I do seeing the sentiment across these platforms, even with retail investors getting to that level of price appreciation. And I think it's good moving forward to show that we have not gotten into the bull market yet. And it's showing maturity in the crypto market. I remember when I first got into Bitcoin, I'm sure you remember it. Bitcoin used to go up in other cryptos 30, 40 percent a day. That was mm -hmm. normal. I remember one of my friends, I called him one morning and said, hey, Bitcoin's up 20 percent. He said, don't call me unless it's up 25, 30 percent. Hung the phone up on me because that was nothing back right. in 2014, 15. We used to see 20, 30 percent gains every other day. To, and also drops, right? The volatility was crazy, but volatility is coming down. The market's becoming more stable. And this is one of the reasons is people have more confidence to hold long term. So it's, it's a very positive sign. So Bitcoin, actually, if you look at it from a technical standpoint, it's poised for a breakout around September, October to $86,000. Right now, it's struggling with around fifty nine sixty. It's a lot of resistance at that level. But if it's able to break past that over the next two to three weeks, we could clearly see 86000 sometime September, November of this year. So I clearly see Bitcoin getting to 100000 based on the inflows into the ETFs. There's 75% of people that are holding Bitcoin and also we haven't seen retail involvement yet. So as soon as these three things start to unfold, we're going to clearly we're going to see Bitcoin go quickly to that hundred thousand dollar mark sometime at the latest January, February of next year. Yeah, I think another thing for everyone listening to consider is all of the global adoption we're seeing every day. Now, we've recently read that China is getting on board again, which they've been so against cryptocurrency for quite a long time. We're seeing what's happening in some of the other countries. India's adoption, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this adds to not only supply suppression, but also price appreciation. So I think it's a really good sign for us moving forward. And this holding pattern is significant because it means that the available supply of Bitcoin for trading is reduced. And when supply is tight and demand remains steady, an increase in price generally happens. This is simple economics. So I'm excited for it. I really think we're in a great spot. I know everyone is tired of hearing about why isn't it moving? Why are things stagnant? This has been happening in every bull cycle and having in the past, and it continues to do so now. That is why I don't get concerned when we see volatility. In the past few weeks, when we see Bitcoin down 8% or 10% or Ethereum down 20%, people just panic and they don't understand. Like we've been saying and saying, you have to learn this. When in doubt, zoom out and look at the long-term picture. I think that is the most important thing everyone needs to do, 
even as volatility decreases, it's still important to understand there is going to be continued volatility. And if someone can't withstand that, then they're not truly an investor and they should take up stamp collecting because this is not for the weak at heart. You have to understand to get the potential gains that you will see in cryptocurrency in the coming years, you have to be able to be strong and withstand the volatility. It's so important. Yeah, with cryptocurrency and with any investment, long-term investment always will be short-term investment, right? Is that there's opportunities for short-term get in and out, but overall, you're better off long-term investing. And we always talk about the story that a lot of fund managers will actually tell you. They'll say that the people who do best in their under their umbrella are people who have died <laughs> or lost the password yep. to their accounts because their accounts have been free to grow over the years because they yep. haven't been in and out, changing, buying this, selling that. They just let it grow over 10, 20, 30 years. And those that we see are the best performing accounts. So with cryptocurrency, if we look at everybody's accounts and their, how, how much they've grown over the years, the people who have held the longest do the best, right? Yeah. The short-term traders in and out of Pepe coin, in and out of Dogecoin, those people long-term don't do as well as people who just hold and, and hold for multiple years, five, six, seven yeah. years. Those people, if we just look at the data, they've done a lot better than the short-term traders. Yeah, I want to touch on that, too, because I used to be that person, even <laughs> though I was experienced and even... Even though I was seasoned, I'd been doing all this for a decade or two, I would still think that I was the one person that could time the market. I could get in and get out and, and make sure I knew when. And I'm telling you that being long term now and not day trading or swing trading has just changed my life over the last, let's call it 10 years since I stopped doing that. And it has made everything so much better for me as an investor. And that is why it's so much better for all of you is you need to be able to stay focused and actively manage your money. But that does not mean selling and buying and getting in and out every single day or every single week. So it pays to be patient in investing, right? It's a lot of people are writing me, what's happened? I thought you having was going to explode Bitcoin and we were all going to be rich. You have to be patient. Now, the having's effect does not take place for months after. We, we right. said from the beginning, four to six months. Now, yep. if we look at the data, Bitcoin's peaks have historically occurred 518 days to 546 days after the having, right? We're only, what, three months now? Yeah. So what is that, 90 days? So we're not even, you know, 20% along the path of where the peak should be, right? So for the, the last having was April of 2024, right? So we should start seeing the we should start seeing some gains here in the next three or four months, yep. six months after the having. So that puts us at about October, November. We should see the peak of the market sometime middle of next year or maybe the end of next year. So we still have a lot of time to wait. Just be patient and those gains are gonna come. And that is why I say a thousand times a week to dollar cost average. Exactly. When you get money, the more you automate your investing, the better off you're going to be in the long term. Because if it were that easy for us to just get on a microphone, tell you when the bottom was, when the top was, so you knew when to buy and when to sell, we'd all be multi-billionaires. And guess what? It's not that simple. And that is why you have to learn from different people like us. You have to be able to to be patient and when in doubt, zoom out. You have to be a long-term investor because if you're not, you're a speculator or you're a gambler and that will not help you in the long run if you are not paying attention to what we talk about. Yeah, every having has the same pattern. That's why I like investing so much because it's based in patterns. Mm -hmm. So trends and patterns, if you follow those, you can make a lot of money. Every having has the same pattern, right? There's a rally right after the having. There's a brief correction, consolidation, and then a major bull run, right, which we're on the cusp of right now. So I just like watching these patterns, and I like watching these things unfold. I agree. So let's get into talking point number two, which is a little tricky, and that is Brazil approves its first First Solana ETF, but why did the U.S. filings disappear? Yeah. This is huge because we're seeing all this great news with Brazil and the Solana ETF filings, but then we also saw that Vanek and 21 share Solana ETFs were removed from the CBOE website, hinting at a potential delay or denial. And so we have to look at it that experts speculate the SEC may not consider Solana a commodity 
which complicates the ETF approval. And that may be why they disappeared from the website, I believe, this morning. So despite global success, Solana's network issues and regulatory hurdles challenge the U.S. ETF approval prospects. And although I feel like everything is going in the right direction, I was surprised to see these filings disappear from the website and to see the SEC taking one more shot at uh, pushing back on the crypto space. So let's dig into this a little bit and talk about your thoughts of why the SEC would do this and what does it mean for Solana? Do you think it's a headwinds or do you think it's going to be business as usual and keep going? Yeah, I had a lot of hope for this. I really thought that Solana would be the third ETF that was approved. So it's, it's disheartening to see that it, everything just disappeared. So yeah. I, hope, I hope everything's going okay and it's just like a blip in the road, but I don't know. But we know that Brazil approved uh, a Solana ETF recently. And, and if America, United States, isn't careful with all the SEC hoopla and pushback and all of these regulatory issues, we're going to be behind. Is that uh, Hong Kong is Hong Kong and China are approving a lot of these ETFs. Brazil has just approved a Solana ETF. They're doing a lot of big things in Europe. Russia just approved Bitcoin mining. They made it legal there. China's also done yep. something similar. So if the United States isn't careful, we're going to be way behind. This is one of the biggest technological advancements in, in all of our lives, right? I think blockchain and AI are going to change all of our lives significantly. And if the United States isn't ahead of that, we're going to be significantly hurt in our future. So we have to be careful that we just don't over-regulate this stuff. So hopefully it's just something, maybe like an anomaly that happened. Hopefully it's still on the path to approving the Solana ETF, because that leads the way for the XRP ETF, right? Because XRP is the only coin that has regulatory clarity. Yeah. So that's what's, we're going to have a lot of problems with Ethereum, Solana because they don't have that regulatory clarity. So hopefully all of this gets resolved and he starts to play ball with crypto. And if there is a new administration, hopefully that administration can see the potential. I, I think both sides see it now. Yeah, I think we're going to have to see it from both sides, regardless of who wins the presidential election. The good thing is it's 90 days away, because right now the SEC keeps pushing and pushing. And the longer they keep suppression in development in the U.S. markets and pushing back with these projects, the more it opens the door for other countries to develop and get ahead of us in development in blockchain and cryptocurrency as a whole. And I think it's really important for the U.S. market to stay ahead of the curve. And that's going to depend a lot on who wins the presidency. And we talked about this, that over 75 percent of, of Gen Zers said that they would vote for whoever, whichever president was pro crypto. And I think that's very important because we just can't keep losing ground and being put at a standstill because of the SEC, because it's really, really terrible, because a lot of these projects take a year, two, three years to develop. And if these companies and VCs are afraid to invest into some of these companies because of the fear of what the SEC might do, that is really, really bad for the long-term upside of development in the blockchain and uh, crypto markets in the U.S. Yeah, I like what you just said about un the uncertainty part of it, is that the SEC is creating so much uncertainty around crypto that VCs, the talent, they can't acquire talent. Companies can't acquire talent. Yep. VCs are afraid to invest of losing out their entire investment. Angel investors are afraid to, and institutions are afraid to invest. As long as the SEC does not come out with a clear list of, of items or requirements for crypto companies, it's going to be hard on all of us going forward. So I just hope that all this gets solved in the next administration, and I hope that America has a clear path going forward as regards to crypto. Yeah, I think we will find the path because you're seeing more and more news right now with Kamala Harris and her message is definitely changing to be more pro-crypto. And that could just be that her camp is making her aware of the importance of it. It doesn't mean, again, we talk about pandering to voters. It doesn't mean that it's going to go well for us because what they say and what they actually do are two different things. I saw, I saw a TikTok yesterday where the guy said, 
that he loved Kamala Harris's speech of all the things she was going to do when she was in office. And he was like, but wait a minute, she's been in office for years. What has she done? And so we just want to make sure whoever wins the presidency is pro-crypto because it is one of the biggest things for the future of the U.S. economy and helping level the playing field for the average Joe. That is one of the best parts about cryptocurrency is for years now, the retail investor and the average Joe could put some money into cryptocurrency and be ahead of Wall Street, be ahead of the biggest firms, and be able to have an opportunity to build real wealth. And those that study and follow websites and X and podcasts like the Crypto Trends podcast will be ahead of the curve because you always hear me say, you don't have to be the first to an investment. You just have to be ahead of the masses. And that is what we try to provide here every single week. So let's get into one of the other headlines we saw, Solana, the iPhone of crypto. So can Solana outrun Ethereum and become the next biggest thing? It's already an Ethereum competitor, obviously. And where does it line up for the future, even with this bump in the road that we're seeing right now with the filings for the ETF being pulled? I don't see it as a big negative. Solana is too big to fail, in my opinion, at this point. They're building a lot of great stuff. They have a ton of momentum. So for me, I think it's business as usual, but let's discuss it a little bit for the audience. Yeah, the, the crazy thing about blockchain is that when you send out the code to all the nodes on any, any blockchain, that code is already out there. So you have to, in order to update the code, you have to make sure everybody agrees on the code yeah. update, then you have to send it out again. So what it does, is it leaves a lot of opportunities for competitors to come in and make even better blockchains. And then five years later, somebody makes a more efficient, faster blockchain. So every three or four years, we're going to have a competitor to a previous blockchain that was doing well. And Solana is the competitor of Ethereum right now. And a lot of people are saying Solana's faster, it's more efficient, it's cheaper. In five years, there'll be another one right. that's faster, cheaper, and more efficient than Solana. Right. So there has to be a point uh, in which developers say, look, this is where we're going to stay, and this is where we're going we're gonna to build on, and that's it. So I think Solana is a great opportunity for a lot of newer developers to develop these meme coins, smart contracts, other stuff on top of the Solana blockchain. But I don't think Solana has the potential to surpass Ethereum. And I, it's just one word for it, one phrase, really, is first mover advantage. In business, that's huge. Mm -hmm. First mover advantage is something that is very hard to overcome when you're a competitor, regardless of how fast, efficient, cheaper you are, in the customer's or end user's mind, the first mover is the best per the best uh, option, right? Ethereum was the first programmable blockchain ever. So a lot of developers, uh, a lot of companies put a lot of money, effort into learning how it works and how to deploy applications to the Ethereum blockchain, how smart contracts work and all of that. And they've been building up for years. So they can't move that code off of Ethereum to Solana. Right. So Solana could be one of the top four cryptos. I think it's five now. It can move up to four. And it could be one of the most used blockchains in the world. And I can see a lot of newer companies choosing Solana over Ethereum. But I still think Ethereum's going to number one eventually over the next three years. I think Solana has the potential to maybe even three or four somewhere up there. And it's going to be a widely used blockchain. But I just don't think it has the uh, overall potential to beat Ethereum as being number one. But I do think Solana can get to 800 to 1,000, maybe even 1,200 this cycle. You brought up a good point, and I want to illustrate it a little bit as it relates to AI. You don't have to only own one investment in a sector. When you look at AI right now in stocks, everyone's talked about NVIDIA now for a year and a half, two years because of its meteoric rise. But then right on NVIDIA's coattails, you have AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, you have Micron Technologies, you have Palantir. So when you're looking at investing and figuring out your weighting, how much do you want to own in that sector? That is a good way to reference it because when you're buying cryptocurrency as an investment, you don't have to buy just Ethereum versus Solana. A lot of people do that. They're like, is it this or is it this? It doesn't have to be. It can be both. If you believe Ethereum is going to outrun Solana in the next five years in appreciation and development, then maybe if you have $1,000 to invest, you 
you would do 600 in Ethereum and 400 in Solana. So just keep that in mind. You always want to be investing in best of breed, but it does not have to be one versus the other. That's a good point. Like It's almost like investing in the overall concept, yep. right? Is that you don't have to invest in a specific company, a specific industry, or a specific like uh, token or coin. You can invest in the overall concept. Programmable blockchains, blockchains in which you can write NFTs, smart contracts, de decentralized applications, decentralized uh, finance applications or whatever, is going to be huge in the future. It's a good idea, I think, to diversify among many tokens and coins. I agree. So with Solana and Ethereum, they both do basically the same thing. One does it in one way, one does it in the other way. But the good news is that interest rates are more than likely going to start dropping sometime in, over this next year. So as interest rates drop, people start looking for risk on assets. And that's decentralized finance applications on the blockchain. So if that does happen, your strategy of investing in both would play out well for a lot of people. That brings up a good point that I've been seeing so much talk about layer two blockchain and infrastructure sectors like decentralized science, decentralized social, and they're leading the way. So those are some of the bright spots. And I found a stat yesterday that VC investments rose to two points that VC investments rose to $2.7 billion in Q2 of 2024. And so I want to talk about that. Decentralized science is really important, and I love this field, decentralized social, because I feel like people are a little overbought on AI, and so people are looking for these other newer sectors that are important for the future of blockchain and cryptocurrency, and I think decentralized science is very important, as is decentralized social. And some of the call-outs that we've had in the past, let's call it year and a half, really remain and stay at the top, and I want to call those out real quick. So for decentralized science, the ones that I've been talking about and you've been talking about are Axon Dow, Origin Trail, Research Coin, and also I really like Data Lake and Genomes DAO. They are smaller projects, but I really like them. And some of the top players in decentralized social are TonCoin. Everyone knows about that. We called that out about a year ago. Mask, Steam, and then also I really decentralized social, which is DESO. So I just really wanted to touch on this for a minute because as the markets have been down or sideways or whatever, there is still a lot of this behind the scenes money coming in. If you think about $2.7 billion just in Q2 by VCs, that is a huge number and a very bullish sign for the future of cryptocurrency, especially decentralized science and decentralized social. Yeah, I like talking about these layer two blockchain and infrastructure sectors like these, because this is great, is that, and also it lets you know where how early we still are in yeah. cryptocurrency, right? Is that I'm going to explain to you what layer one, two, three, and all this stuff is that the internet has seven layers. That's what makes it so easy to use, right? If you go down to the lowest layer, you have to, it's very difficult to use because all these things like IP addresses, how we route the information, all this stuff is taken care of, even the presentation layer, that when we bring up a web page, we see pictures, graphics. Yeah. formatting, all that's one of the layers up to the seven layers that where we can use the internet. So we're only on layer two on blockchain, right? right? So let's say if we were building a house, right? The first layer would be built, built, digging the foundation out. Second layer would be the plumbing. Yeah. Third layer would be the, what do you call it? Like the framing. The framing. So we're only on the plumbing. Right, right. <laughs> So that's how early we are before a big blockchain is used every single day. So this just, we're very early in this, and all of these coins are going to build the plumbing of the whole blockchain infrastructure that's coming into the future. So I love talking about layer two when we get to layer three. We're already on some, it's some layer three solutions already yep. in blockchain. So I think we'll probably have a seven layer, like the same way we have in, in the internet once this is all said and done. But we're very early. I just want to uh, make sure you guys understand how early we are in cryptocurrency. Yeah, we're definitely early, and you can tell by the news cycle of where we are. I saw a Michael Saylor interview a couple days ago, and his new bull case for Bitcoin is $13 million a coin by 2045, which is pretty crazy, pretty out there. We realize he is a Bitcoin maximalist, but this is a very bold statement. But the way I look at it is we've been hovering around this 58 
eight sixty thousand dollar mark for a very long time. Even if we go to six hundred k, we're a ten x from here. You know how long it takes to ten x in a stock or in a mutual fund or an ETF. It takes a long time. So keep that in mind when you're considering: is it too late in Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of the projects we talk about? XRP. Keep in mind if we see a five or a ten x in those in this bull market or in the next bull market, that's only six years time window to potentially five or 10 X your money. And that is a huge, and that is a huge accelerator for getting your wealth built in these alternative investment strategies like we talk about in cryptocurrency. So I hope that adds some clarity to all of you. Thank you for stopping by each and every week to the Crypto Trends podcast. You can find us at Instagram, you can find us on Instagram at Crypto Trends Podcast and also on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. We appreciate you stopping by each and every week, and we'll see you next week.